Oh boy. Here we go. Hi, everyone, and welcome to my second part of the Love is Blind season three rundown. Oh shit. A lot happened. A lot happened. By the way, hi, I'm Kendall. What's up? Um, if you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, home skillet biscuit? We're talking about episodes eight through 12 of Love is Blind. We have the, all the weddings as well as the reunion all released, la that was released last Wednesday. And short and sweet, it was a mess. But I'm here gonna tell you my thoughts, gonna tell you my feelings for cast members now that the weddings have happened and people are together or they're not. But before we get started on the breakdown, we gotta send it over to a very topically appropriate sponsor. So send it away to Admiral Kennedy. <laughs> Hello everyone, it's Admiral Kenny, and today's video is sponsored by Bright Sellers. Sommelier service, monthly subscription service that allows you to discover interesting and unique wines that are curated specifically to your taste based off of a quick seven question quiz to figure out what would be best to your taste, what you're pairing it with, as well as your general lifestyle. How does wine fit into your daily life? Again, I've talked about how Bright Sellers have helped me become a rich auntie in training. I feel like one of the things you get better at as a rich auntie is you travel the world and you drink a lot of wine. Cause why not? You ain't got no kids to raise. <laughs> and since I've been working with Bright Sellers, I've been collecting these cards so that I can like better understand which wines, I haven't drunk all of these by the way, before you, before you start, don't start on me. I like wine, I'm responsible though. <laughs> I've been collecting these so that I can notice patterns around which wines I prefer more than others. And these are also great to have if you plan on giving a wine away, you can have your friends look through these and they can figure out, oh, I like the sound of this one. And today we're going to try Forever Fleeting. I don't remember if this came in the last shipment they gave me or the current shipment they gave me, but they gave it to me, I know that. White peach, nectarine, dried herbs, and apple blossom. It would be great to be paired with pastries, topped with fresh fruit, tofu penang curry, that sounds good, with coconut milk, or sip while watching DIY videos on YouTube. Felt a little too personal there a little too on the nose. And it's not DIY, it's decor at this point. I'm a grown woman. <coughs> just tasting, just a little bit. I got editing to do. I don't know why in my head I associated it with a much sweeter wine, like a Riesling or something, but no, it's actually really nice. I've been making this really fancy grilled cheese recently and it's like ciabatta with fresh mozzarella, prosciutto and balsamic glaze on it. This would be great. So if you would like to check out Bright Sellers, you can check out my link down below where Bright Sellers is giving an exclusive limited time offer for my viewers. They are doing $50 off your first six bottle box. Save that money, drink more wine. Big thanks again to Bright Sellers for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. I have my wine. I have my lunch. Today's food is harissa chicken, cucumber feta salad, and yellow rice. Oh, also before we get started, because I know someone's gonna ask, you see my little teddy bear earrings? I'm gonna link those down below. Those are a friend of mine. She makes a shop where she makes cute little earrings. And every time I wear some of her earrings, I get bombarded with people asking me where they're from. These are her teddy bear collection. She doesn't know I'm doing this, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> this isn't sponsored. She didn't ask me to do this. I'm just like, I'm wearing them and I know someone's gonna ask. Okay. Episode eight. It is 10 days before the wedding. It is the day after Matt had his whole meltdown about Colleen going to the club. And she's really considering whether or not she can stay with Matt because he's, he gets so triggered and runs away. And she doesn't know whether or not she can trust him to stick it out when things get hard. So that really, is hard for her to determine whether or not she wants to say yes to him because he seems like he would bolt at the first sign of things, not even a sign of things going wrong, just when his insecurity makes its appearance. Again, I said in the first part, I think Matt is a ticking time bomb waiting to happen because of his insecurities, because of his trauma associated with dating um, and his ex-wife cheating on him and getting pregnant by another man. That's a lot and it's pretty obvious if you're watching the show that he has not dealt with that. He has not gone to therapy or if he has, he didn't really listen or stay very long. <laughs> and because he hasn't dealt with those emotions and those feelings and those insecurities and how that shows up, his insecurities have bled over into her, into how he interacts with her. This is the hallmark of a, a lot of people's relationships. So I wouldn't be surprised if she ends up still marrying him, but I was just hoping that she wouldn't. Bartis, Bertis. <laughs> Somebody said he looks like Bert on Twitter and I've a lot, I can't look at him any other way. Anyway, Bert, Bart, mm. 
Bartis and Nancy are in a weird space from the last time that they talked. Nancy brings her issues to him and it seems as though after this, they reach a generally good understanding and seem to be on common ground. Even though his like defense is still like, I'm trying to get over these things that are a problem in the real world. He's talking about the ex being involved in her property and him just not finding her hot <laughs> essentially. Um, Which he goes back and forth on. He'll, I'm not attracted to her. And then he'll say like how much he is attracted to her, but somehow they're able to reach, you know, a common ground. Again, we don't see that whole conversation. So who knows what they actually talked about, but SK and Raven, they have a moment where they kind of talk about, it doesn't come off great on camera, but I do get where Raven's coming from, where she's basically like, I'm not like the other girls, you know? The other women seem to be aspiring to having a lot of children and possibly being stay-at-home moms and, and have this very traditional view of marriage and a woman's place in that marriage. And Alexa kind of brings up like, in a joking way, they were talking about who would make the worst wife and it was Raven. She picked Raven. She was like, it just feels like you're so to yourself. I can't really imagine you as a wife because that is so different than how people kind of traditionally think of wives and mothers and how they must kind of drop their entire identity to some degree to be those things. And I, and, and she's like, I'm not that person. I would never be that. So it's hard because it makes me feel like something's wrong with me. Like I'm dropping the ball. And it's like, no, I get where she's coming from because I honestly feel that way a lot of times too. The thing is, as SK ends up saying, is that basically there's nothing wrong with that. It's that you need to find a person who understands and values that and validates that and meets you where you are and who wants an equal. And I want an equal. I want someone who has their own ambitions and goals and aspirations and identity. I want that. And I want to build with a person like that. And I just, I thought it was very cute. Zenab and Cole are seemingly reconciled from the last time we saw them. It, if you recall, the last time we saw them, they were fighting, what was it? They were, they were fighting about Colleen and him being attracted to Colleen and being inappropriate talking to Colleen and stuff. So they seem to have worked that out. They're very lovey-dovey um, in a way that feels disingenuous. I'm sure that's an editing thing. We haven't seen the time that passed between those events. So uh, it comes off very jarring and inauthentic when he's like, I'm just so attracted to you, Zeneb. Like, I think you're gorgeous. But whatever, we haven't seen what transpired and they seem to be on very good ground right now. Very romantically invested in each other. I think it looks very awkward again and jarring since the last time we saw you, you were like going at it. Back to Raven, she's going to find some like garments, ornaments, like headdresses and stuff that are traditionally Nigerian and she wants to add them into her wedding so that it's very authentic to SK's side of the family. And then she'll wear like a more Western American style wedding dress. So it's like a mixing of cultures. And I think that's really cool. You know, there's aspects of her, there's aspects of him. But while she's there, um, talking with SK's mom and like the woman who runs the shop and another random woman, I don't know who she is. They're kind of talking about what expectations she should uphold as a woman in a, tra in a traditionally Nigerian um, marriage. And again, I don't know if this is edited in a particular way, but it does come off very like, you have to be very in line. You have to respect him. You have to respect the family name. You have to adhere to a very patriarchal, traditional structure of home, family, gender. It reads as very woman-led misogyny. Edited, so maybe it's just there to give like a little like drama, but oh, I could see Raven, the person that is very, again, independent, not quite adhering to those very traditional views of how a woman is supposed to exist in a marriage. She's kind of like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I could see why that would kind of scare her if SK wasn't so vocal about how that is not what he wants in his marriage because he's seen that dynamic and it is not fulfilling to him. It doesn't, it doesn't, the logistics and the emotions and the, all that that goes into that very traditional structure does not appeal to him at all. And he likes the things that make her very atypical for who, one would expect him to marry as a Nigerian man. Speaking of dresses, uh, all the women picked dresses. Personally, I thought that most of the dresses were ugly that they tried on on this day. On the actual wedding days though, some of them were better. At the dress fitting, Zenab cries about her family, her parents not being able to come to her wedding. Uh, if you recall, they're both 
deceased and they died when she was quite young. So this is a very heart wrenching experience, especially because Cole's family doesn't want her. Essentially, they're they're very like, I don't even want to be involved in anything in relation to her. We'll meet her when you get married, essentially, which is shady as because that's weird. I got kind of teary eyed. Honestly, this episode was very boring. I don't know if you could tell by my voice. <laughs> I found this episode incredibly uninteresting, but it did feel like suddenly, all of a sudden, all of the couples were getting along, even though they were like arguing and arguing and arguing just the last episode. <laughs> so I don't know what happened. I don't know what the production team told. They're like, kiss and makeup, makeup, or you don't get any money. I don't know what the, I am so curious, by the way, what does a contract to be on Love is Blind in entail? Because I, at this point, I, I, we're on season three. A lot of people that just felt like they should have broken up already. I'm like, why did y'all go until the wedding? And they always say like, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know. And it's just like, all of you didn't know until the wedding day? So I can't help but wonder like, where does production fit into that? Do they, do they give up money or something? Do they give up something if they quit? before the wedding day? Like, what is that? What's the con contractual obligation in regards to that? I'm curious. The episode ends with SK and Raven talking about how he has concerns considering her family is also not coming to the wedding. And Raven kind of says like, what am I supposed to do if they don't want to come? I can't make them come. And I know that my family not coming makes your mother uncomfortable, but it's like, what, is she, what does she expect me to do? Like, I can't drag them in and I'm trying to do so much to make her comfortable and your side of the family comfortable. I'm bringing in all these Nigerian elements. I'm trying to make everyone comfortable. Like it's obviously a discussion that they had to have, but they had this incredibly ill fit dramatic music in the background to make it seem like it was a big deal. <laughs> it is very crucial for me to have their backing. But it was just because they were ending that episode, they needed to be like, ooh, drama. But anybody watching it would be like, why is this music so intense for this conversation? It's actually not <laughs> that big of a deal that we gotta do all that. Episode nine. So this episode begins with Bartis and Nancy getting permanent jewelry, an idea that is his idea because he said he always wanted to get a tattoo of his wife when he gets married. And so this is like the first step. Um, when I heard the words permanent jewelry, I was like, what does that mean? My head went to worst case scenario, epidermal piercing, <laughs> like bracelet all around. We are singed together, baby. It's not that bad. It's just like a very, very thin chain bracelet soldered together so that it's there is no clasp so it's permanent but honestly one quick tug you can get that shit off i was like oh that makes me feel okay because the <laughs> if i was <laughs> something about this freaked me out my avoidant tendencies nuts when i saw this scene because there were so many things that i thought i was like i could never like this isn't even that permanent but that freaked me out for some reason and also and also, there was something about doing this, him being like, yes, let's do this, let's go forth with this, that felt like to me as a viewer affirming that he's gonna get up there on the wedding day and say now. Something about doing all this, doing all this for show, like this is great, this is our love is forever. I knew that he was gonna say no. Watch. This does all it is and then says no. Thank God it wasn't a tattoo. You'd be <laughs> Brendan and Alexa, I haven't been bringing them up a lot this season, honestly, because there's not much to say. They've been in love this entire time. They haven't had any major fights. They haven't had any fights. <laughs> the most they've disagreed, and I wouldn't even call this a disagreement, is that when he moved in with her, she had a lot of clothes. So they had to figure out where to put his clothes. But they do have this situation that I thought was interesting. Her family's Jewish. So they have like certain things that they wanna do for a Jewish wedding. And one of the things that they needed to talk about was a prenup because apparently, I didn't know this, uh, apparently there's this understanding that there would be a prenup and that, correct me if I'm wrong by the way, even if they get divorced, he will continue to provide for her and their kids. There is this kind of insinuation from her father that she was raised affluent, she was raised rich, she has money, and I expect that to continue in marriage and I need you to be able to provide for her in that way. And I was sitting there thinking like, damn, that's a lot, that's a lot of, that's kind of hard. Cause like, it's heavy on a person in general, but then Brennan has talked about how he was raised very, very poor. Also based off of the last part where I was talking about his mom said that he's a runner. I don't know, are we 100% sure that they'll get married? Because 
I could see someone with a lot of money anxiety running away because of that. And I just felt like they've been doing so great up until this point. And I was just sitting there like, when's the other foot gonna drop? Because it's like, y'all been doing so good this whole time. Watch you say no at the wedding. I hope that doesn't happen because y'all seem very happy. Matt meets Colleen's parents. I wasn't gonna bring this up, but I just wanted to because I find Colleen's parents so f adorable. I don't know why she like the mom. She looks like a chipmunk and she's just so she just they seem so dorky and so adorable and awkward. And I just I really like her parents for some reason. Later, they end up at an aquarium date, which was also incredibly cute. I want somebody to take me on an aquarium date. That would be so nice. I wish somebody not Matt did this for her. I'm scared of Matt. That's kind of how I feel anytime he's on camera. He frightens me. And especially because Colleen strikes me as the type of person that will try to love him into not being this person. And she does not have the faculties for that, babe. They start talking and he asks essentially, how do you feel about us? Do you think you're gonna say yes or no? Like, what do you, how are you feeling? I don't know. Cause we have had problems. We have had things that make me question whether or not I could spend the rest of my life with you. He, and you could see him getting visibly agitated. I just, I Colleen, just. Colleen, stop playing games. No, I'm not playing Tell games. Tell me how you feel. I just. Say it, say it. No, I just. Say it, say it, say it, say it. No, no, no. Say it. I just. Say it. And he has this thing where he's like looking at her and he's so f intense. I, I talked about in the first part that the men this season are terrible. <laughs> They're really bad. But now that we're getting some footing, Bartise strikes me as kind of your like typical boy. Cole, also boy, but also a man child. So some of his things I do believe he does just simply because he's fucking stupid. It wouldn't be a guy I wanna talk to because I don't like stupid people. There are times that Matt feels like he's fighting her. I didn't bring this up either in the last part because I just talked so much, but he also has, I've noticed a pattern that he'll get very combative with Colleen, but he'll listen to men. And based off of him getting cheated on, I wouldn't be surprised if he's created this whole thing in his head where it's like women are the enemy. Admittedly, I'm really scared <laughs> for Colleen. And anytime really it's her and him having any form of kind of difficult conversation because we've seen enough of him flipping off the handle and only being talked down by men that it elicits a pattern to me. But yeah, I'm not saying that to say the other guys don't do shitty, terrible things, but the closer we get to wedding day, it's like comparing apples and oranges, probably really shitty, uh, childish, immature, someone that I'm actually scared of. Speaking of Cole, uh, Zenob and Cole have completely seemingly reconciled from any of their issues and uh, her insecurities about how he feels about Colleen and other women and blah, blah, blah. And he's starting to make dinner for her. Like he's like, I'm gonna make dinner for you, right? And Zenob, Zenob, sweet, sweet love. She does not know how to just let him do shit. <laughs> According to editing, again, who knows how this all, all went down. Um, it basically ends up looking like Zenob took over the kitchen from him. I'm excited you're finally cooking for me. You said you were going to for so long. Fun fact, you put white wine in a stemmed glass because a hand around this warms it up. So you drink white in a stem so you don't touch it. I didn't think anything was wrong with the wine thing. I thought that was good information. That wasn't nitpicky to me, but I was like, oh, I didn't know that, okay. You started the chicken early. Aren't the potato fries gonna take ages? You like literally flipped it. Do you have it? Why aren't you holding it where the raw bit is? This was meant to be you cooking for me, babe. Very white, not seasoned piece of chicken. Please season it. Don't, we don't need any more on this side. But she does kind of nitpick over how he's cooking the chicken, when he's putting the potatoes in. She kind of ends up like taking it over from him, even though he was trying to cook dinner. Arguably, going back to what I was saying in the first part, they've created this kind of dynamic in which she's parenting him, nitpicking him a lot. I got the feeling that Zenob is A, very insecure. B, has been forced to grow up very quickly. So she probably has this general outlook on fine, I'll do it myself kind of mentality. I've been that bitch. I kind of still am that bitch, <laughs> but I'm working on it because one of the things that can kind of happen is if you feel like you can't trust people to participate 
communicate in things with you, you end up making them feel inadequate to you, making them feel incompetent, making them feel like they there's no way to show up for you that you would actually appreciate. It makes you very isolated. If you feel like you have to do everything yourself, you're not gonna ask for help and you're not gonna receive help and then you're gonna be resentful that people aren't helping you. <laughs> also, I don't know Zenob, so I'm basing this purely off of my own observations and not anything about knowing her personally. I'm sure you know that, but I'm just saying like, this is the reading I was getting on her. And then she's with a guy like Cole, who admittedly looks like he kind of under functions. <laughs> it's very childish and doesn't seem to handle things very well. So this just sounded like two people who are gonna butt heads. So when I was watching this, I was like, okay, I know. I know I'm not a fan of Cole, but Zenob, let him do this. Just let him do it. If the food is nasty, is that the end of the fucking world? He's doing this as a way to show his affection, to show that he's trying to care for you, to show that he loves you. Sure, maybe it's not the best meal you've ever had, but it's about letting him do that. He's like, I gotta micromanage it. I gotta micromanage it because he's gonna fail, essentially. Now we're gonna have a conflict <laughs> because he, now it feels like, do you even like me, Zenob? Because you treat me like I'm lower than you and like you demean me. We have a thing where either Cole's gonna have to grow up and meet her where she's at maturity level wise, which is unlikely, or she's gonna have to stop being so high strung and come down to him, which is also unlikely. Speaking of parental, he is a fucking child. I forgot to tell you. Oh my gosh, with cooking chicken. This whole dinner Nerf gun thing devolves into an argument. Again, the thing that I was basically saying, like I could see this starting an argument because basically he's like, I feel like you don't even wanna marry me. Again, I understand why he would reach that conclusion from how she kind of interacts with him. Sometimes, again, this is also editing. So who knows how much this actually comes up and how naggy quote unquote she actually is. There is some evidence to suggest that she does have some tendency to be insecure and nitpicky about certain things. I didn't bring this up in the first part, but in one of the earlier episodes, they got into a tiff because she said they had such a great night and he said it was so, so good. And that started an argument over semantics because she was insecure about if he thought it was as good as she thought it was. And then she kind of resented him for not saying it was great as well. So I could see that being incredibly annoying. So he kind of says like, I feel like you don't want to marry me. And she's like, basically, I won't know 100% until the day of, honestly. Yes, we have issues, but nothing that would make me say no at this point. He says that he feels like she criticizes him a lot. And she does admittedly, again, what we see on camera. He's like, I get the sense that you don't want to marry me, that you don't like me <laughs> and that you think I'm inferior to you. And again, I don't think he's crazy for thinking that. And that's why I said in the first half, I'm like, this is a bad idea because you're going to end up parenting him and now you're both going to be resentful. And now here we are. <laughs> and one of the things that go along with either Cole's immaturity or Cole's just general inability to filter his words for whatever reason, says things and doesn't really consider or ask himself whether or not these can hurt people and how these words come off. And that's a bad thing by itself. But when you combine that with a person who's already insecure, this is a ticking time bomb. So I was just sitting there like, oh God, this is gonna be a mess. It was like, essentially, I want you to be sweet to me. I want you to be nice to me. Oh, there was a point where he said, just be unassuming. And I was like, ew. Oh God, you really need to figure out how to talk to people, Jesus. No, I'm not always gonna have a great attitude. No, Zay, I wanna just not get punched in the face when I first see you. And again, who knows to what degree she really was as naggy as she presents on camera. So I don't know if this is an over-representation of her being kind of a hawk over what he does, this kind of micromanaging thing. But if we're basing it off of the things that we've seen on camera, I don't think that he's particularly wrong in saying that. <laughs> like, is he wrong in saying like, hey, can you not but this conversation again because cole doesn't have a filter and he just says shit are you bipolar no no what the f and so she gets rightfully offended and he keeps going oh are you bipolar you you're not bipolar things. no and now if she were to cuss you out she would have the right to and it was a very oh it was awful it was bad i was like what the was that you crossed the line. You crossed the line Cole with that one. That was nasty. That was ugly. Cause he didn't say it as if like, I'm concerned. Is everything okay? Like genuinely, is everything okay? You're bipolar, right? You're bipolar, huh? 
so you are bipolar. It was not cool. It was nasty. And then after that, Zeneb gets rightfully upset. I would get upset from that and just walked out. Episode 10. The next episode starts with Cole going after Zeneb. He's such a fucking idiot. Like he's like, I had already gotten the sense that he's very impulsive just off of some things he said during the first half of the season. But like now the more I actually observe him, he is so reckless. That's the word. He's very reckless with his words. He's very reckless with how he talks. And that combined with a girl who is already insecure is just, again, a ticking time bomb waiting to happen. And she's like, look, I have hope for us, but if you don't, I'm done. They they end up talking it out, are able to put it aside. I wouldn't be here if I didn't wanna stay. He assures her that a very, very large part of him still wants to marry her. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dale. I basically gave you every chance to say no, you don't want to marry me. Mm -hmm. And you didn't. I would tell you. The women have a bachelorette party and they end up talking about some of their concerns leading up to the big day. Colleen is like, here's the thing. I would take a bullet for Matt, but I genuinely don't know if he would for me. Like, I don't know if he would be around for when things get tough. Reciprocity is so important in relationships of all magnitudes, but especially when we're talking about things as serious as marriage, you're combining so many aspects of your life and there's a level of dedication that needs to be reciprocated for that to work because marriage life in general gets hard it's not going to be good and happy all the time and if you already not even married yet and you like i don't think this would stick around i wouldn't recommend getting married like, and and she's not wrong to suggest that because you have no evidence that he would so like here we are we're still going back and forth about whether or not you want to marry him i feel like we should have reached nah by now <laughs> i don't know what their contracts look like for love is blind so maybe there's something that says even if you want to say no keep saying you don't know zeneb brings up the argument that she had with cole where he called her bipolar and how cole's parents won't be at the wedding and they don't want to have any contact with her prior to them getting married. They have not FaceTimed her, haven't had a phone call. Apparently they follow her on social media like Instagram, but they will not have any contact with her directly because quote, and this is according to Zeneb, so this is filtered through her. She isn't the type of girl we'd see you with. Now, I don't know about y'all, but did you read that as racist? Cause I did. <laughs> Cause what information do you have about her other than genuinely just what she looks like? They haven't met her, they haven't talked to her. They know nothing of her other than her Instagram. I'm sure she's not flashing pussy on the gram. She doesn't seem like the type. So what are you talking about in regards to quote unquote, the type of girl he'd be with? Racist, right? Right, that's what, yeah, right. Here comes Alexa, my girl. She reminds, it's funny because like, we start to see more of Alexa, it seems like, as the show goes on. And I find her so funny. Me and her are so similar. Our sense of humor, very dry, it seems. I don't know her, but hey girl. I like clothes too. Let's be, let's be buddies. I'm not trying to talk shit about your fiance. That is a man child. He is not good enough for you. He's not at your level. You're better than this. And she's like, I see him trying, so I don't want to give up on us. Okay. They all have their bachelorette party at like a Chippendales male strip club type thing or whatever, which ugh, just a bunch of strange dick swinging around my face. <laughs> it just sounds not appealing at all. They seem to have fun. I was a little concerned that they were doing this as like a setup, <laughs> especially for Colleen because meanwhile, the men go to like a rodeo. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who asked for that one. <laughs> they go to a rodeo. They don't end up going anywhere with strippers and stuff, at least not on camera. Again, I don't know. And they just kind of talk amongst themselves about their upcoming weddings and like how they feel about it. They're all scared for the most part, reasonable. Bartise, <laughs> Bartise is like laying it on super thick with his friends who, I'll just say this. When I saw his friends, I was like, that makes a lot more sense. I'm not gonna explain what I mean by that. He's like laying it on really thick about how much he loves Nancy. And I was sitting there like, I don't want, he's gonna say no. Like the more he's talking to everyone about how great she is, the more I feel like he's specifically going to say no. And finally starts the wedding. The first wedding is SK and Raven. I first would like to say Raven looked 
gorgeous, amazing, ethereal, specifically her eye makeup. It made, it really brought out how like feline some of her features are, like very lion-like. Um, she looked so good. And then with the turban and the veil, and it just looked amazing. She looked really, really pretty. Congratulations on your face. They show all the like things that led up to the big day, how they were kind of awkward when they first met, but how they connected in the pods and how they've, how their love has genuinely grown. You know, I haven't talked about every scene of the show leading up to this, but like they've had a lot of moments where they're showing how in love they truly have become over time. So of all of them, including Alexa and Brennan, I feel like these two people for me felt like the most sure foundation for like an actual relationship. They both have like a very beautiful moment with SK's mom and she very much so like approves and wants them to be married. So the vibes were really good leading up to the wedding. I do not. What? What? Bitch. Beach. I was shocked. I was shocked. And the mom was too. She was like, what? On the altar, he's like, basically, basically, I love you so much. I don't feel like today is the day for this for us. I get it. Like you, like f the show. I, I don't think he should have came on the show because he kind of should understand that this is a possibility. You would be getting married or whatever, but who am I to judge him for that? Because he fell in love with somebody. And long story short, he just knew they weren't ready. He didn't want to just get married because everyone in the audience wanted them to get married. I think I grew more respect for him for that. Again, I love SK and I still do. That was very courageous of him. He knew that could possibly really hurt her. He ends up saying something along the lines. He was like, I'd rather lose her forever than marry her. And we end up just being resentful of each other because we weren't ready. I think that's, I think that's very level-headed. I think that's very reasonable. Maybe I should date a Scorpio again. The first one didn't work out, but he had a lot of leap replacements. So maybe that's, hey Scorpios. <laughs> With that said, Raven ends up taking it quite well, uh, you know, as well as you can expect in a situation like this. She's like, I understand how hard that was for him. Yeah, I don't feel great about it. It hurts. Like she was crying and stuff. Admittedly, I was planning on saying yes. Yeah, and she just looks really sad. And his mom comes in to console her afterwards. And she's like, I'm just really sad. <laughs> I'm really sad about it, but. You know, and, and at the end of it, I was really sitting there like, I hope these two continue to date. Please continue to date. Cause I would hate for this to be the end of everything just because it's true, y'all weren't ready. Like, I hope they continue to grow and get to the place that they're at their own pace and they're ready. The next wedding and the wedding to end the episode is Nancy and Bartice. Again, leading up to this, I'm like, they ain't no way in hell he gonna say yes. Leading up to it, he's just breaking down. He's like, I just love this girl. And I just, she's such a great girl. Like, <laughs> I don't like Bartice, but I don't think this emotion was insincere. I think he was really upset. I think he was really struggling with working through his emotions about how he's undoubtedly gonna say no. I was still like, oh, here we go. <laughs> like, I just knew it. I was just like, oh God. So allow me to rip the bandaid off. Nancy goes up. She looks him in the eye. I do. My heart dropped. <laughs> yeah, I've been joking about Bartise undoubtedly saying no up until this point, but I was really scared because I was like, Bartise, please say no. Obviously, Nancy is the type of person who won't acknowledge that this is a bad idea. This is a terrible idea. She loves you so much that she cannot perceive how bad of an idea this is. She's all in. So please, if you, which undoubtedly you are not all in the way that she is, please say no to spare her for her benefit, say no. And his answer is episode 11. I do not. What'd I say? What'd I say? And I was so happy. I was elated. I was like, thank God. Because again, if Nancy's already said yes, she's really at the place where she's like, I'm all in. But if he says yes, now she's stuck with this piece of shit for who knows how long, until you can get that annulment and until she can mentally understand that this dude sucks. I sighed a massive sigh of relief. I was really happy for her. She wasn't very happy about it. I mean, I understand that it sucks, but like also, yay, dodged a 
fucking bullet. Her family, especially her brother, uh, what's his name, Steven, and her mom, they wanted to beat his ass. <laughs> they wanted to fuck him up. It was both funny and incredibly awkward though and uncomfortable. It was like this weird mixture of emotions seeing the family get really hot, especially the brother, because he's like, I knew he wasn't worthy of her. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I just didn't wanna be right. I understand that you're really hurt about all that and you're really hurt that your sister is hurt. But guys, let's think of the positives. I think this is great. I think this is fantastic. I feel like a person who knew that they weren't gonna be good to you decided to leave. Why are we mad? <laughs> I feel maybe we should start the fiesta. I mean, why should the reception go to waste? After leaving the altar, Bartise comes after Nancy and they try to talk by themselves, but in comes her mom and then in comes her family. And she's like, please, please go away. And they would not leave. And you know, they ride or die, but it's true. Like leave them alone. They need to work this out. You can't fight everything for her. The mom ends up saying like, he's not good enough for you. He's not ready for you. He's not worthy of you stuff like that. And he turns to her and says what I was thinking, which is basically like, if you believe I'm all those things, aren't you happy that I didn't say yes? Would you have preferred me being the way that you perceive me, not good enough for her, not able to show up for her in the way that she deserves? Would you have wanted me to say yes? And that's what I mean, start the fiesta. Like he's a person that we all perceive would not have been able to show up and be a good man to her. And he decided because she wouldn't, she was ready to pour and pour and pour and pour. And he was like, ah, don't even do that. I'm a lead. That's great. Again, I don't like Bartise, but this is the best thing he's done the whole season. They're able to speak alone. And she uh, essentially says like, you blindsided me. You blindsided me. I did not think you were gonna say no. I genuinely didn't. I was ready to jump in. I was ready to do that with you. If you say no, then it's like, what's more black and white than that? None of this means anything to me now. They edited this weird. So it's kind of hard to know what he's referring to when he says this. But he says like, that's wild of, to hear you say that because you were just saying yes up there. Like how did that flip so quickly? If, if this is what I think it's referring to, her being like, the things that you've said to me mean nothing to me. Um, sir? Wow, that's incredible. It's because you said no. <laughs> because you said no, why would I put more energy into a person who obviously doesn't love me the way that I love you? We've had this reoccurring theme over and over that you don't love me the way that I love you. So this is the ultimate black and white moment. We're done. I'm done. No, we can't date after this. I, she ripped the bracelet off. She was like, this shit means nothing to me. I'm done. I thought this was great. And I know she's hurt, but she'll get over it. Not me completely skipping Alexa and <laughs> Brennan. They get married. I don't think that should have shocked anybody. I really liked his speech though. It was very, very cute. Congratulations. I hope y'all happy forever. Yay. Next wedding, Zeneb and Cole. Leading up to the wedding, both of them are incredibly unsure. They're both saying that. They're one minute lovey-dovey how much they love them and like how much they are their person. And the next they're like, we have a lot of issues that are really hard for us to get through. And leading up to them getting married, I genuinely had no idea uh, how this was going to go. I hoped they said no. I felt like Cole, he, sh he struck me as the type of person that would just take a leap of faith. I knew that probably Zeneb would have to be the one to say no, but there were also moments that I didn't really talk about a whole lot because it's not interesting of them being super lovey-dovey. So I, I had no idea like where this would go. They seem like a type of dynamic that gets married a lot. So I wouldn't be surprised if they got married. Cole goes up there looking like his dog died. When Zenob gets up there, she says a prayer with him. She thanks God for giving her an opportunity to know him. And that's when I was like, ooh, she's gonna say no. Um, which yay, again, I don't feel like they should be together. And I was like, great, they shouldn't get married anyway. This is great. <laughs> but <laughs> she doesn't just say no. <laughs> This lady, the lady in the audience, that was my face. She does start off with like, you know, I thank God for you. I thank God for bringing you into my life. But you and I both know that I'm not the person that would be best for you. Um, I have tried to manipulate and mold myself into that person for you. And I can no longer do that. And I was with her up into this. I was like, yeah, I mean, I probably wouldn't have said the like manipulated and mold myself thing on the altar, but. And then she starts going in though. Disrespected me, you have insulted me, you have critiqued me. And for what it is worth, you have single-handedly shattered my self-confidence. I can't marry you and I, I don't 
you are a good man and I know that. And I wish I, I wish I could have had more of that. I really do. And then to, to like punctuate the incredibly awkward situation, her friends start clapping. And I laughed so hard. <laughs> that shit was funny. I'm sorry. Very awkward and so uncomfortable. But her, when her friends started clapping, I was just, I lost it. I was crying. But here's the thing, and I'm probably gonna rustle some feathers about this one. And I, it's not the first time. I tend to have opinions. Uh, you can agree with it if you want. You don't have to if you don't. I think some people forget that just being a bitch on the internet means nothing. <laughs> Do I think she was wrong for dragging him? Absolutely not, because Cole needs to be dragged. I believe that. But there's something very particular about doing it on the altar. And I was sitting there asking, I was like, whose idea was that? Was that the producers for like drama? Or was that her? Was that her being like, this is my moment to say all the things I feel. And I'm gonna just say deuce after that. Um, either way, I thought that was not cool, personally. I feel like the parts about like how you've made me feel, you've disrespected me, you blah, 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 you've insulted me, should have been not on the altar. <laughs> that should have been like a, a Nancy and Bartiz thing. They stepped away and really had that conversation. Like the reason I said no is because of these reasons. I do or don't want to continue this relationship. We actually won't be able to watch the entire clip because it's incredibly long. She goes on and on and on. I'm just sitting there like, this is not the time and place for that. Like sure, he deserves to get told off, but on the altar, especially after you said the night before that you still wanna get married to him. This isn't making either of y'all look very good and it's giving very hurt people hurt people. And I just really wish y'all would've broke up before y'all even got here because imagine you in the audience, you were like, I thought we was coming for a good time. And then after she leaves, they do the like after interview and she starts crying. She's like, I don't want him to hate me. Yeah. I don't want the guy to hate me, but I couldn't marry him. And I'm like, babe, what do you expect him to feel after that? Again, I don't like Cole. I don't like Cole. But if you can do that and then say, I hope he doesn't hate me. I was trying to let him know how much of a great guy he is. And it's like, I don't think you fully understand how some of the things you say comes off. <laughs> Compare this speech of sorts to Deepti from last season. What was it? Let me listen to Deepti's speech right now so I don't misremember. No, I cannot marry you. I deserve somebody who knows for sure. I'm choosing myself and I'm going to say no. Yep, there it is. It was quick. Yeah, that's how I remembered it. She just said, I'm choosing myself. I deserve someone who's sure about me. And she walked off. There's nothing more to say. I'm, I'm sure in who I am. I want someone who's sure about me. And she just walked off. I think some people thought of like Zenob's whole thing is very like, yeah, stand up for yourself. For it. But to me, it read as incredibly insecure, incredibly insecure. You can probably tell by how many times editing Kenny is popping in that I, <laughs> I feel like I have to kind of caveat my opinion a bit because it is hard to really get a full grasp on how this felt if you didn't watch the entire show. But basically, instead of being this like, I'm choosing myself and I deserve better and I'm just gonna go on my way, it doesn't feel like something she did for herself because arguably most of her speech isn't about herself, it's about Cole. <laughs> it's about Cole being a jackass. And some people may say that, you know, he deserves that because, and we'll get to that in the reunion, he, Zainab accuses him of saying some really terrible and doing some really terrible things behind the scenes and off camera. I don't know, maybe this is just because when I'm done with a person, I don't have the energy to do all this. Like maybe that's why it reads that way to me. When I'm done, I'm like, oh, you've treated me terribly. Like I don't even need to have this conversation with you, goodbye. But it does feel very calculated and it does feel like she wanted to do it on the altar specifically as opposed to any other time after saying no and getting off the altar or before going to the wedding. And that to me kind of undermines doing it for yourself at that point. Also, I feel like I have to clarify this because people people are very like, are we defending Cole now? No. Said it in part one, I don't like him. His personality is incredibly annoying to me and he needs to learn how to watch his mouth. But I can also see where he's coming from with her sometimes. With that said, I'm not saying all this or critiquing Zeneb in an attempt to undermine her. I really don't like this kind of like misogynistic fervor that's going after her. Crazy delusional woman. No, she She's just a flawed human being that let her insecurities get in the way. And I think because her kind of issues became more of a highlight towards the end of the
the season, there seems to be this kind of like retrospective, Cole wasn't even a bad guy. Cole was a jackass. <laughs> They're both not good for each other. And that's my point. But I also don't feel like it's appropriate to be like, she's just as bad as Cole, cause she's not. She's reactive to his bullshit and it, got messy because of that. I wish she wouldn't have handled it that way, but hey, here we are. That's why y'all shouldn't have been together. This is always where I'm gonna go back to. Uncomfortable to look at, just all around, just messy. Like somewhere around that time and the reunion, I was just like, this stopped being fun. This ain't even fun. <laughs> this is just hard to watch. Okay, all right, who's left? Colleen and Matt, okay. Again, there's a lot of this like back and forth about whether or not they're ready and Matt is talking with his friends. One of his friends straight up says to him, he's like, I don't think you're ready. And Matt says, I don't think I am either. <laughs> and he wants to be married and he wants that and the other. And I ain't hear one thing about going to therapy. But when they get to the altar and they're face to face, they both say yes. Aren't we happy? Aren't we excited and not at all frightened for Colleen? <laughs> Honestly, it was really rough to watch. <laughs> it was like, I, it's like watching a car crash. It was, it was bad, but they seemed really happy about it at the time. So congratulations, I guess. <laughs> Episode 12. The reunion. So all of the couples and all of the singles have returned. Talk about their experiences, hash things out. Obviously some time has passed. I will say this reunion was kind of annoying before I even get into it because I feel like they didn't really touch on some of, in my opinion, some of the more important things. Um, they kind of focused on Honestly, it ends up just devolving into Cole and Zeneb kind of going back and forth later, but I'll get to that in a bit. Colleen looks like she's being held hostage. Bartise looks even more like Bert than the last time we saw him. Alexa and Brenna look happy because they're always happy. Cole looks tired, sad. They start by talking about Cole and Colleen and the pool party situation, the inappropriate flirting and about how attracted he was to Colleen and I look over at Colleen and Matt, Matt has this, again, he, I, he concerns me so much. He has this kind of like body posture, like his, his body language is very like over her. And again, she looks like she doesn't blink. Are, are, are they okay? <laughs> like, is she actually okay? But she looks even more nervous when that clip comes up for obvious reasons, even if Matt wasn't the type of person that he kind of reads to me. Um, she looks really uncomfortable and she like apologizes to Zeneb and to Matt and everybody. She's like, I never wanted to disrespect you because I love you guys so much. Um, I just really didn't know how to like handle that and I should have cut it off and all, you know, all that stuff. Um, Matt basically says, you know, seeing it was hard, but it wasn't anything that she didn't tell me that day. I didn't take it very well. And they kind of just blow past how he raged that first time we saw him rage and how uncomfortable that was to watch. SK and Raven are brought up and apparently they are still dating, thank God. I think they're so cute, I really do. And I hope that they're able to go the distance because I really, really like them. They're really cool. They talk about Bartis and the incredibly weird and awkward ass conversation he had with Nancy about how much he's attracted to Raven. Was there a part of you that regretted having cut it off in the pods? No, there was no- You lying ass. Like, they turn to Colleen and Matt. And again, they look so uncomfortable. She looks like she's in a hostage situation. How are you guys doing? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're really good. They kind of ask like, how has married life been? I mean, we definitely dealt with a few little day-to-day -day arguments and stuff like that. And they're like, yeah, it's been great. Help me. But you know, we're just, you know, taking it day by day kind of vibe. Honestly, I'm really scared for her again. And one of the things that I really hate about this reunion is that they don't, I repeat, they do not touch on that. Swept away, it's like, yeah, he didn't handle it very well, but you know, we're working through it. It's squabbles. They, 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 they really minimize to such an extreme degree how out of pocket, I'm about to eat a cookie by the way, how out of pocket Matt has been in regards to his jealousy and his explosive outbursts and stuff like that. If you're wondering what cookie I'm about to eat. Coco Libnis. 
<laughs> That's probably not how you say that. They make fun of Andrew and the eye drops. They uh, let everybody know that he was invited to the show, but elected not to come. You know, to lighten the mood, they kind of joke about how that was a very accurate representation of him on the show. And luckily for everybody, he declined. <laughs> I'm sure it would have been even more of a mess if he would have come to that. They return to Bartice and Nancy um, and discuss a bit of the aftermath of their wedding not going the way Nancy had planned, at least. I think it was the promise that you made to me that you would not blindside me. And literally you, you did the complete opposite. Apparently the next day or within days of the wedding, he was already seen out and about with a tall blonde girl, someone who is presumably closer to his type that we've articulated throughout the season. There's video of him out on a boat with her and you know, she's hugged up on him on his lap and stuff. Look, I understand that for all intents and purposes at this point, he is a single man, but Within uh, 48 hours of ending an engagement that had a wedding and within two days, you already with another chick in public? They ain't even take the decorations down yet and you already got it. It's a very man thing to do. Like, fine, I'll just I'll just meet up with anybody else over it to get over it. He also starts like trying to defend himself. I was drinking and I was, you know, doing all these things to cope and I, I'm not I'm not gonna sit here and go into my sex life. I don't think that's anyone's business. And they were like, who's going into your sex life? We're talking about you were seen with another girl. I mean, yeah, you, they were like, you were alluding to it. I was like, you probably did. We weren't even talking about that. We're talking about how are you out and about with another person in two days after a wedding fell apart? I wouldn't be surprised if like after the union, he started trying to talk to Nancy again and be like, I've been broken without you. I wouldn't. Men are so predictable, it's so scary. <laughs> they don't do nothing new. It's the same shit. You've seen it before, you've seen it all. But it was still a big yikes. I was like, ew. And also very hurtful to Nancy. She was like, wow. Again, y'all didn't even put the chairs up yet. And you already. Okay, so they move over to Cole and Zenob. And like I said, this entire episode ends up kind of just devolving into them, like going back and forth about, you know, the pain and processing and yada, yada, yada of their wedding. It's obvious that the women on on the stage are very, you know, backing Zena. They obviously are not fans of Cole. <laughs> and they say that this is, Alexa in particular brings up, she was like, there's a lot of things that we know that he's done off camera or the cameras were around, but they didn't put it in the final cut, right? She's like, at his bachelor party, he came to Zeneb and told her that a girl gave him her number and he wanted to kiss her. You said, I do have something to tell you. I tried what? to I tried to kiss a girl what? at the bachelorette party. Oh you said I'm engaged to get married and I just wanna kiss one more girl. And she was like, no. To me, that felt like something aligned with Cole behavior that I've seen on the show. Yikes, big yikes, even more yikes. I'm gonna need y'all to shut the f up and keep some thoughts to yourselves. But he swears up and down that he never said that to her, that they never had this conversation. He never saw any girls cause they were at the rodeo, if you recall. So he's like, that did not happen. Personally, I believe it happened because we have seen Cole do similar things on camera. That sounds like a very Cole thing to do. I would not be surprised if he did that. That's in line with how he's kind of interacted with Colleen. That's in line with how he kind of talked about other women. I've said it in the first one that he gives me cheater energy. That sounds like something he did. But the other like cluster of issues she has with Cole, and uh, mind you, I'm gonna trigger warning this cause this is a lot about like food, body image, possibly ED, be mindful of that. Basically, she says that he would nitpick, criticize my body and my face, push food away from my table, try to convince me to order a salad. And there's something that she refers to as the cuties situation. I was eating like a banana and a teaspoon of peanut butter just so I wouldn't like pass out on the long days we were filming. It was like 2 p.m. we were still filming. I hadn't had a chance to eat. So I grabbed two cuties, like little tiny oranges, he looked at me and he goes, are you gonna eat both of those? Well, like, yeah, that's a, that's a serving. And he goes, we're going out to eat later. Like maybe you should save your appetite. Oh. Cole swears up and down that that is not how that conversation went. And since it is on camera, please show the clip. Please show it so that you can see that is not what happened. So they end up showing this clip after the entire reunion is over, but I'm gonna bring it up now. They end up playing quite a long clip. It's like leading up to the conversation. Are you about to eat two of those? Maybe, that's a serving. You better, okay with that? You better save your appetito. I've only had a banana and a like scoop of peanut butter today. Oh, big old sucker. 
night. You only had a banana today? Mm-hmm. Why? Oh, I could I definitely you tell you, but I probably bowl. shouldn't. I know you did, but we had that last night. Here's the thing. I could see how this scene could be taken as completely innocuous, especially because he follows up asking her, like, why haven't you eaten? I've offered you food. And I could also see it be incredibly triggering if you already have trouble with food or body image. And the sheer fact that you're asking me at all about how many oranges I'm eating is inappropriate. Both of them could read this conversation completely differently, just triggering each other over and over and over again. No one knows how to communicate. She doesn't articulate to him like, hey, I don't appreciate when you do that. It makes me feel extra. XYZ, or if she does, we haven't seen it. And so they're just going on and on and on until this pressure point at their wedding. After this, the Lachey's basically ask them, does anyone have any regrets? And Cole is like, I do. He starts crying and it's a lot. If I've fucked up the person I love's self-esteem so bad, how can I not regret it? And he starts like ugly crying and it's bad. And at, it got to the point where it just felt like I shouldn't be in the room for this conversation. Did anyone else feel like that? I was just like, this makes me uncomfortable. I feel like this is almost too vulnerable for me to be in the room for. It felt like a very private, intimate moment. He's like crying and he's like, I'm so sorry for hurting you. And like, I've never, I never meant to do that. I've said all these like embarrassing shit on the thing that I regret. And, and she's like, I forgave you when I left the altar. Like, like I really do forgive you. And he's going, he's like, I love you. And I'm just like, it, I'll just focus on work and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, ah. And he's crying about how he just couldn't understand their wedding day. Then I watched the show and I saw how much of a dumbass I am. With that said, some people were very like, oh, poor baby Cole after he's like, you know, crying and shit. I didn't particularly feel like that. I just felt like, yeah, I mean, it doesn't feel good to see the way that you've hurt people. It doesn't. So hopefully I was just saying like, since he's crying and he's he ends up apologizing to the rest of the castmates if he's, you know, made them feel bad in any way or whatever. And I was just in there like, okay, so hopefully because he's felt the consequences, maybe this will make him, you know, reconsider how you talk to people how you talk about people, how you behave, and how you, the things you do affect and possibly hurt people. That's the best case scenario. So I hope he does that. As for Zeneb, I hope she also grows from it because I feel like in a way, as far as we can tell, that she still has a lot of very present insecurities that would probably show up in other relationships. How should I put this? I honestly don't think that I've observed much of a precipice that would make her reconsider how she lashes out because because of her insecurity. I hope this has presented an opportunity where she can kind of observe herself and hopefully in the future, she'll be able to, you know, be self-aware about that and have healthier relationships because of that. I say that to say, hopefully both of them don't act this way to other people. Hopefully everyone in this scenario has grown from it, have learned things from it. It really sucks when those lessons have to be on TV though, which is, God, it sucks to have like your lessons be fodder for entertainment, which is why I wouldn't be on a reality show. <laughs> Cause sometimes you need to take L's in private. You need to learn your lessons in private. L is for loss and lessons. Again, I feel like this reunion ended up kind of hyper focusing on Cole, but I still don't like how we have not talked about Matt. I feel like we're missing the point. So yeah, that's the reunion. As can Raven seem to be happy. Alexa and Brennan seem to be happy. I'm happy for Nancy that she's not with Bert. Zeneb, you looked great, please go to therapy. Cole, get some lip balm, go to therapy. All of y'all go to therapy. It's getting to be a bit much. Bartiz, still a tool. Matt scares the fuck out of me. Colleen, blink twice if you need help. I say you escape while you still can. So there it is. That's the entirety of the season. How did you guys feel about the choices that were made, the people that got together? Do you agree with any of my points? Do you disagree with any of my points? I'm a bitch on the internet. You don't have to agree with me. At the end of the day, we don't know none of these motherfuckers. So all we know is what we've seen on TV. But, but for the most part, I'm happy about everyone's decision except for Matt and Colleen. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.